Next topic uh, that's uh, been changed in NAC is around surge protection. And I'm gonna ask Mike to go ahead and lead the uh, conversation on that piece. Okay, thank you, Phil. This is a significant change in Article 230. Section 230.67 is new, titled Surge Protection. And uh, it's required for services supplying dwelling units. And that's pretty broad in application. One and two family, multifamily, single family. So this would apply. And uh, really the code is responding to an increased need to protect uh, electronics within the dwelling unit that are necessary for safety, such as uh, the electronics within uh, GFCI and AFCI devices, the electronics in smoke alarms, some fire alarm systems that include smoke detectors and heat detectors. There's a lot of ele electronics that are used within the home these days, and uh, this is a safety-driven change to protect the electronics within that equipment. The requirement is such that the surge protective device needs to be located at the service equipment. It's, it's either integral to the equipment, it can be installed inside the equipment, or immediately adjacent there too. And there's also an exception to that uh, general requirement that would allow it to be located at the first level distribution equipment downstream toward the load, such as uh, at a panel board, uh, for example. It's a type one or type two device, either on the line side of the service, uh, disconnect for connection, or on the load side of an overcurrent device at the service. Uh, those are the two types, and of course, they're required to be listed. This is also gonna require, that there's a first level subdivision that gets into replacement. So where you're doing a service upgrade, you're going to have to provide a surge protective device. In the past, you know, it's always been an option for the homeowner, but now it's going to be a requirement. And as Mike pointed out, it will protect all of that sensitive electronic equipment in other areas of the NEC that is designed to protect the occupants of the dwelling. Yeah, and certainly as we think about the, where we connect this, you want the shortest connection possible to have the best performance of your surge protective device. And if you don't install it at the service equipment, then you would need to install surge protection at each distribution point downstream, so if, at sub panels downstream as well, if you don't supply it there at the service. It's always a good, good uh, practice to have two levels, where at the incoming service and that at the point of use. Uh, it's typically going to give you the best protection, but Jim makes an excellent point about the, the retroactiveness in subdivision D. The NEC is not typically a retroactive document, but in the interest of safety, if you're doing a service upgrade or uh, putting a new service on, for example, uh, this requirement would be triggered. Yeah, speaking of new changes for safety, for one and two family dwellings, we now have a requirement for an outside emergency disconnect. And this disconnect was really driven by emergency responders and fire service personnel so that they have a way to terminate all service conductors and remove power from a residential one and two family dwelling uh, so that they can safely do operations. And the equipment has to have a short circuit current rating equal to or greater than the fault current and it's got to be in a readily accessible outdoor location. So this emergency disconnect um, can take many different flavors depending on what other roles it might serve. But the primary role here is for the fire service and their ability to remove power from a dwelling. It's a safety issue so that they're not trying to pull meters or anything like that to remove power for a dwelling. They're not having to wait on the fire service to, on the utility to show up and cut power to the dwelling before they perform operations. So this is one of those changes that is obviously very impactful because now you've got an outside disconnect at a readily accessible location for all one and two family dwellings, but it's also in the name of safety. And I think uh, for emergency response personnel, this is an important change. Yeah, and if more than one disconnect is, is provided, they, they do have to be grouped together and we specifically outline what you can use. Another uh, revision here that is outside of Article 230 that, that, that comes into play is there's requirements in Article 445 to shut down the prime mover of a standby generator, for example, that may, may be supplying an optional standby system, and if the dwelling unit had an energy storage system. So Article 706 is gonna require a disconnect, and in, in, in that case, we're going to tell you that you have to take that disconnect for that energy storage system and install it at the service disconnect so that the firemen can get there or any emergency responder and remove power from the building 
before they go in. You know, that's a great point, Jim, because also with solar, solar installations in a residence, um, you have the rapid shutdown requirement. And so these, these disconnect functions perhaps could be um, consolidated, right? And, and one disconnect performs several functions, but it's clear now from a fire service response, emergency response, that they need that access. Yeah, and th there's multiple ways that, that you're going to be able to do this. It could be uh, a, a service disconnect. So in areas of the country where we put the panel board outside, then all you're going to have to do, it's going to be done, but you're just going to have to label it emergency disconnect, service disconnect. You can have a meter disconnect upstream and you'd label it emergency disconnect, meter disconnect, but not service equipment. And I think one of the most popular ways to get it done is going to be taking SE cable into a meter housing and having a, uh, a device, because list item number three permits other listed disconnect switches or circuit breakers, as long as they're suitable for use as service equipment. And in that case, you would mark it as emergency disconnect, not service disconnect. So what that means is, I don't it, inside that meter enclosure, the housing that I get for the circuit breaker, I don't need to take a grounding electrode conductor. Right. And I don't need to take an equipment grounding conductor into the dwelling unit. So I can come in with SE cable, leave with SE cable and the uh, disconnect in my panel board becomes my service disconnect. And that's where you would land all your grounding electrodes and, and bring all of those uh, bonding provisions to just like you do today. Yes, and it, that would allow the installer to land the equipment grounding conductors and the grounded conductors, the neutrals, mm -hmm. on the same bar. If we treat the disconnect outside as a service disconnect, then is, when we get inside, what we have is a, you know, at that point we have a feeder mm -hmm. into a panel board inside yes. the home and we need to isolate the grounding conductors from the equipment grounding So we're going to have absolutely, we're going to separate the neutral and separate the grounding conductors uh, in that panel instead of landing them on the same, the same bars. Yeah, if you choose to do it that way, yes. Yeah, and one more item in the marking piece, it's really clear that the outside marking of the product is where you have your emergency disconnect marking. Uh, you know, Jim walked through all the different scenarios as the function of the disconnect switch, but as far as the marking, you want something that is readily accessible and readily visible even at night for the fire service. So red background, white letters, emergency disconnect is what you'll see on the outside of the enclosure, regardless if the handle of the disconnect is actually inside. Uh, this will be on the outer cover of the enclosure.